All right, welcome back to the Fuse Show, everybody. My name is Bud. I am an account executive here at Xfusion.io and co-host of the Fuse Show. I am very excited today to be joined by my guest, Juan Betancourt. Juan is the CEO of Human Intelligence, where he leads the Miami-based culture and talent intelligence startup. They were recently named a top startup to watch by the Miami Herald, uh, whose solution helps organizations accurately measure and manage culture at every level of an organization, from individuals and teams to overall corporate culture. He founded Gonza Executive Search and served as a client partner for Corn Ferry International and Hydric and Struggles. Um, all of this has teed up his work for Human Intelligence, named the 2021 Top 100 Influencer in Our Space by HR Executive Magazine. Juan is an expert in using the BMW methodology, which stands for Behavior, Motivator, and Work Styles, to manage and hire for culture fit. A cultural analytics approach to building teams leads to increased engagement and productivity. That was a lot. Welcome to the show, Juan. Appreciate you Thanks, being on, buddy. Yes. Hey, I'm excited for this. Um, culture here at Xfusion is huge, and culture for you is huge. So I'm excited to have this talk. Um, tell us uh, just a little bit about human intelligence, and then uh, and then we'll get into it. There's there's a lot to cover here. Yeah. So human intelligence, we're called the culture software. We've been around for seven years. Uh, we have major clients like Coca-Cola, Lyft, Bank of the West, Aflac, Dollar General, uh, and several other ones, and, and then hundreds of small little one clients. Obviously, we have big and small because culture is something that's important to all companies, whether it's a startup or Fortune 500. Um, we're the first company to truly measure it um, bottom up. So not the aspirational culture that's on websites, you know, the companies put on t-shirts and coffee mugs, but we actually take a psychometric test that's proprietary to us um, that you give to, let's say Coca-Cola gave it to 10,000 employees in one day. And that same day wow. you get visual mappings of each of the cultures of every single team, every division, every function, all the way up to the CEO dashboard to see what the culture of the company is. Now, this is more around not like an engagement survey that asks people if they're happy or not. Those are really temperament, but that won't tell a company that's, you know, like a restaurant chain that wants service oriented service and self starters and people solve problems. It won't, you know, engagement surveys don't actually give any insight into whether you have the right people in the jobs. Our tool does. Our tool is more around culture of performance and culture of operations. What are the behaviors of your people? What are the work styles? And what are the motivations of those people? Um, we call it BMW, behaviors, motivators, work style. Um, and, and your culture is different in your marketing team, and it should be, than your sales team, than your finance organization. Because if you had finance people who thought and, and, and worked like your marketing people, well, one of those two groups would fail. And so culture is not this monolithic thing that people used to think it was. Um, it's actually a bottom-up thing and it's very diverse within an organization. And we're the first coming to measure that, help companies manage for that um, to a culture of intention, but also hire for the culture, whether you want to clone everybody and look the same or actually guarantee diversity of thought and get rid of this bias that exists today in hiring. Yeah. So I, I was listening to some stuff that you had talked about earlier on, on a, you know, a couple different YouTube things and, and going through, um, going through your webpage. Um, and, and you know, what you said there is culture is different in, in different parts of the company. And, you know, I, I used to be the, the chief of staff until we realized, you know, the, the chief of staff position here just isn't, isn't something that we really need, right? So now I'm, I'm an account executive and that is a huge shift for me. And that is a complete culture change for me, right? And that just happened. So when that happened, like the wind was taken completely out of my sails, right? So I'm like, oh, what am I gonna do? And that, I mean, my, my culture personally was was shot for a few days. Like, I'm just like, Whoa, this sucks. Right. Like I loved the position that I was in and, and I, I was the one that was kind of pushing the culture. Right. And, and now I'm, I'm one that gets to live in, in the culture that is being pushed by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a huge change for me. Um, but what you're saying is there's different cultures in different parts of, of the business. And I see that 
as the old chief of staff, when I was pushing this, we have people in, in different countries, right? We have a huge, a huge portion of our, our people in Kenya. And then we have a smaller portion, but still a big portion of our people in the Philippines. And when I was trying to create culture, I'm like, how do I do this? Like we have a big main culture, but how, how do I pull yeah, these where, subcultures And where is it together? overlap? Yeah. Right. How do I pull these subcultures together? And then I have one in India and one in Mexico and, and one in Jamaica. And how, I mean, that's a big play, man. So with what that, you're that doing. That is what our software solves. And, and most companies only start to really think they feel it when they're going international. But even Starbucks the barista or team of barista in Hialeah, Miami area here in South Florida, where it's all Latin customers and Latin employees, what leads to great net promoter score and great customer service is where you have the baristas asking personal questions to the people in line, touching them, picking mm-hmm. up their baby, spending 30 minutes before yeah. they check out, right? That's great. That's a great culture of experience in those stores. You take that high-performing team of baristas from Hialeah, you put them in New York City where I used to live and work. And you have them touching customers, asking personal questions and picking up the right. customer babies, that Starbucks would close and those people would get fired and sued, right? So same yeah. companies, the same roles at companies have actually completely different cultures, even geographically within the US. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. So I, I live in the Northeast corner of Colorado. You know, I mean, farmland, Right. And, and the closest, you know, your example, the closest Starbucks to me is 45 minutes away in a little town called Fort Morgan, which is still farm country. Right. But yeah, that, that person there, you put them down in, in Miami yeah. and, and they're not going to perform the same right. way. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you guys have your own That's culture. Like that person at Starbucks might fail. They might be the top performer at Starbucks in Colorado. You put them in Boston or New York city, they might fail. Right. So it's, people are starting to wake up that, even within the same role, you're going to performance needs a different culture for depending on where they are. And so it, that it gets really complicated. And the reason why companies don't perform and why you have bad hires and why you have turnover and lack of engagement is because of this problem. So yeah, and an engagement survey will tell some a company, this person's not happy, but it's not, it's missing the real driver, the real DNA, the real reason why our tool explains why engagement surveys end up with people not happy. We actually explain the why, not, not the what. That's awesome. That's awesome. I like it. And, and how are, how quickly are your customers realizing when, when they're, when their employees fill this out, are they realizing, man, this tool is crazy good. Cause I'm, I'm suspecting it's fairly quick. Yeah. So just on the demo that we do with HR and maybe sometimes they're pulling the CEO to see the results, you, you know, you do a, a demo with HR and you have, let's say dollar general, they have 40 people at headquarters in HR. They have comp and ben, compensation benefits, the culture of that team within HR, same function is very different than the culture of talent acquisition. The, the comp and ben are typically very data driven. They take their time. They're methodical. They're long-term. Um, they don't make quick decisions, right? talent acquisition they're like running around their heads like chickens cut off they're running making quick decisions right so even within hr you have completely different cultures so usually we show the different cultures of compensation benefits um talent acquisition learning and development you know and and other areas analytics and even that they automatically see the 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 differences and they realize wow we want to see this for across our whole company and then we do it for the whole company and usually within a week um, you know, you can get 10,000 people on this platform in a week, right? You give it a link, you say, hey, this is a great self-awareness tool. You will take this 12-minute test and learn about yourself. The company will learn um, the culture of the team. The team leaders will learn the culture of each team, how to work better together. Um, and, and the company then will also understand really if they have the right people in the right jobs to achieve their, their goals and strategies. And then it does, if the answer is no, we don't, here's the great part. You don't fire people you can actually now show with data to a person who's not performing how to get to what they need to be because now you have the data. It's not just this, the boss saying, hey, you know, it's not working out. You got to go. It's, or it's just not working out. Try better or fit in better. I mean, that's too vague. You, you can change behaviors and you can even change work styles. And even that third part, motivation, um, you know, if somebody's self, you know, more about the individual and, and unique versus belonging and service, if you show them that, the 90% of the performers are belonging enough service in terms of their motivation and all the 
bad performers or basically independent, unique decision makers on their own, they will either say, wow, you know what? I'm at the wrong company, the wrong job. And maybe you can find another job in the company where they would fit. Or they'll say, you know what? I need to change and I'm going to be more service oriented. I'll be more belonging because that's what it's going to take. If I love this company, I'm actually going to be more of a team. I, I realize that's why I'm not getting along, right? And so it's it's when you throw data and give data and make it accessible to people, usually, I mean, at first they're scared, but usually it leads to a better outcome for everybody, both enterprise and employees. So I took this test, right, you know, this morning before before we uh, hopped on this. And, and I have a couple questions because it's, I, I felt that a couple of these questions, I'm like, the, some of these are kind of muddied, but I, I'm guessing that there's a reason for it. And, and some of these quite like, they're, they're very similar questions with just slightly different answers. And I'm like, a, a little bit muddied, you know, but I'm guessing that there's a reason that muddied. You know, right, like, like it's hard to prioritize one through four, um, right? It, it was there's yeah. there's seven specifically seven questions. I'm guessing like the four seem to be so similar. I can't I can't prioritize this, but it's done on purpose, and you actually do end up picking things that make a difference in the outcome. Um, how how accurate at zero to hundred percent? How accurate were the results in terms of your behaviors, motivators, and work styles? Well, I'm I, I think pretty good. But it, it says I'm I'm 22% team player, and I'm like, well, I think I'm more of a team player than that. But I'm 41% helper, 37% improviser, and I think those are pretty right on. So I'm like, well, let maybe me share I'm a screen so a people player. can see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you're you're on the right here. Okay, so you're on the right. Um, and and by the way, just so you know, um, there are 20 personas. Okay. Okay. These are your top three. So of 20 things you are basically 90% of who you are is team player, improviser, and helper. So it's it's not that you're only 22. I mean, uh, basically 90% of your psychology and how you operate and think are these three things, not the other 17. So th these are your dominant traits um, of 20 things. So it's, you know, don't, don't read 22 as you're not, you're actually really a team player if, if, you're, if this made a top three of 20. Now, between these three, it shows the balance where number one, two, and three, it is helper than improviser than team player. Um, you can see where I'm, I'm a maverick, an architect, and a helper. Um, and then it breaks it out individually to, you know, for example, these are the behaviors, right, of our BMW framework. You are yeah. mostly change oriented. You see how you're kind of off to the right on all of these bars. You're extremely yeah. free form, extremely outgoing. Um, I'm actually a little more opposite, more deliberate, more steady. I probably take longer time to make decisions. Um, I don't, you know, I don't take as much risk. I'm pretty cautious. Uh, in terms of motivators, we're much more similar there where, you know, uh, these motivators, um, my first three are to the left. Now you are very helping like me. So we're very similar. We have two dominants that are the same. Now mm -hmm. here on these, it basically says you're 50 50. So half the time you actually are similar to me on these. So we're very similar there. Um, and then I'm kind of 50 50 here. We're both free, freedom oriented. So the one, the one real watch out is you are more belonging in, in what motivates you. And I'm more unique in what motivates me. Um, so that that's the motivators. And the third, just to complete the BMW analogy of work energizers, um, you know, you, you like proven methods, working with people in variety. I like new solutions. That's why I'm building new products all the time through software, right? Um, sure. um, you have created, for example, a very scalable podcast where you can do many and it's like turnkey because you have this systematic ability and you put structure into it. Um, you know, I also like structure and, and is needed to run a company clearly. And, and I, I do like working with facts. I mean, we're a data analytics company basically, but around psychometrics. Now, th this information gets rolled up where you can actually, um, you can actually see the information for a team. And I'll just show you quickly, just so people understand what we're talking about. So you can actually see like for my company, Human Intelligence, I can see my team and it'll show 
the culture rolling up that data. You don't have to take another test. The culture of my team, here are the behaviors. We're 40% change oriented, 60% dominant stability. So we're really balanced. When I started the company before we had the platform, we were actually 85% over here. So everything was like extreme and nothing over here, but then we weren't able to grow well. We were, we were too one-sided of a company. And so that wasn't good. Um, and then we moved to, uh, to motivators and motivators were about 50, 50, 50 innovative, 50 service. As you can see, I've created a very balanced company and that's, that's yeah. by design. Only when you have a platform like this, can you use data to actually get a company to be this balanced. It's, it's not luck. Um, you can also see where people plot on this as a team, like, oh my God, most of my employees sit right here. Three people sit right here. Um, you can see kind of who the people are. If I want, who's the most extreme proven methods person? It's, it's this person, Beth. Who's the most flexible people in the company? These two, let me give them a project if it's flexibility that's needed. Um, and then you can see that all the, of the 20 personas, you can see kind of quickly as a, as a team leader, you know, the dominant personas. These are the five dominant personas out of the 20. We don't have any people in this area. Maybe when we hire, we might want to hire some people with these personas um, so that we balance out the problem solving of the team. And then, you know, you can work that all the way up to, you know, 200 people, a thousand people, um, you know, by division and see the culture for each of these different groups. <laughs> Well, and there you have it. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good commercial right there. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Um, yeah. So it, it's funny. Cause I just, like I said, I had, I had another podcast that, that finished half an hour before we started. <clears throat> and he's a gentleman that, that does very similar things but his isn't for culture like his his is more personality based okay. um test right and and I, and I was telling him that I I did your your assessment and I was I was actually saying it's it it was kind of it took me longer than 12 minutes cuz it was kind of muddied and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at some of these answers and I'm like well I answered this one differently the last question that I'm going to answer this one I'm like, so I'm like, am I wrong in answering this? No, it's because of the context. I'm like, there's got to be a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And those are the ones where, let's say, deliberate, decisive. I think if I recall, um, actually, let me pull one out. Um, where That's where, where you were answering differently, but the same kind of question is one where, for example, deliberate and decisive, you were kind of similar. So what it means is in one context, if the question was teed up one way, you would actually answer it because you're, you would say, I'm deliberate. But the way we ask the question next time, you would actually say, well, actually, no, I'm pretty decisive, I make quick decisions. And it basically shows that you're someone who's adaptable. You actually have a very agile personality. Usually people are only within that, it's 15 bars or units out. Usually you don't see many people who are two to three bars and that's it. That means that they really can be either. Those are the questions where you feel like, like wait a second, I've answered, I could go either way and I've answered one similar. So you have that for deliberate, decisive under behaviors. You have that under steady and spontaneous um, under behaviors, under under motivators, that's two already. Supporting influence. So you're also you're a supporter, but you're a leader, <laughs> right? So for example, you're a key account exec now, which is a supporting role, but you're also the C chief of staff, which is a leadership role. It, it, many people can't do that duality. Um, uh, you're knowledge based. You love learning, but you're also really practical. You don't get stuck in the weeds if you don't need to. Most people are one or the other. You like order, but you're also freedom oriented, right? So you actually have more. And then structure flexibility, you're more flexible sometimes than you are that you need structure. So you have like five of those, maybe even six of, 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 of 18. Most people have maybe one. So it just says you're a really agile person and you're almost like a chameleon that can be many different things, which is really good as, as a company. They want people who as employees can, and work, can work in different ways and think in different ways and be motivated by different things because that makes you more, you know, you can plug in more holes. Like it's a, it's like, imagine the, the point guard who can also shoot and can also rebound. Like what basketball team wouldn't want that person, right? You play all those multiple roles at your company, which shows why, even though it was somewhat dis uncomfortable for you to switch from chief of staff to key account exec, within six months, I bet you you're doing really well. Like you're very agile. You, you, you know how to, to change, kind of like a great actor who can play a comedy, a drama, and a sci-fi 
same actor, they can just turn on and off certain personality traits when they do it. Yeah. Well, thank you. That makes me feel better. <laughs> so tell your boss, tell your boss you need to raise. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make them watch this for sure. <laughs> um no, that's very cool. That's very interesting. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely keep this and and I'll I'll show them this and uh actually i'll have them fill out the the free one too because i think once actually both of them fill fill this out i think they'd be very interested in, in seeing seeing what this could do um you know i mean we're up to 50 team members and our goal is in 10 years to have have 10,000. so you yeah, you don't grow so yeah and the problem is a lot of a lot of startups that are at 50 who want to get to let's say you know in the next couple of years a thousand ceos make the mistake to keep the same culture mm -hmm. <laughs> there is ah, i was going to talk to you about that later awesome let's go there you now. need a different culture for different phases of the company yes and and a tool yeah, like so ours helps you do that like our culture when we started was not balanced i wanted extreme creative extremely innovative like we need to really break out new products and so i brought on all these like really creative innovative people and that's how we worked but then after four years we had the great amazing insightful innovative creative products but we, we weren't scaling there was nothing repeatable we weren't able to sign up five companies in a week um and so we actually had to train people to be the other side st stability thinking right like much more um uh, reflective before they make a decision methodical um putting in process all the things that startups hate, we actually had to do. And then we, we took off in the next level of the company. And so every company goes through these different phases and they necessitate different cultures. And so a company and a CEO like yours should use a tool like this to say, you know what, is what we've been doing and what we have today, what we need for the next four years. And it's becoming part of the annual uh, business process planning at companies where now they don't look just like at metrics around you know performance and sales and revenue. They're also looking at the metrics of, what's our culture and is it the right culture to support the next 12 months yeah so you, that that goes right into this this question you said in, in a previous interview that you did that you you need to measure culture like a kpi and i have never ever heard that said that's that was fascinating to me and you kind of explained that a little bit just now but can you go deeper into that and as to why that is so necessary. When you said that, I was like, light bulb, like that. I, I think that that's genius, but I think that probably needs to be expanded upon uh, for people that are listening to that. Yeah. So, I mean, I worked at Procter and Gamble, and like the, the key mantra they knocked us down with, um, well, there were several, <laughs> but the, one of the ones I recall, like it's yesterday, it's been 35 years, is um, if you can't measure it, you can't optimize it. Okay. Um, same thing goes with your culture. If you can't truly measure your company's culture, you're not going to optimize the performance of your company because culture is what supports strategy. And imagine if you have this loosey goosey thing over here called people, and you don't really know who you have and what the culture is by group rolled up. How are you really going to hit the strategy and support that? You're not going to perform and you are going to have turnover. And we, we have a recruiting tool leveraging culture insights from the, the test that everybody takes. You can now recruit to that. We actually reduce turnover by between 30 and 40% every company we work at. Because now with data, you can actually hire who's going to work out well. And it's not just because you like somebody in the interview process. So measuring it is key and making it part of that October, November, December, you know, year review um, is key. And for example, when COVID hit, every company, no matter what's printed on their t-shirts and their coffee mugs about culture, right? Every company's culture changed when people had to go remote. Okay. Right. And, and work from home. Every company had to become much more agile. Every company mm -hmm. had to, to have be, every employee had to become much more of a self-starter, right? How do you print at home? You don't have a printer. You used to have to just walk around the corner of your office. How do you do all the things you did? Now you have to do it at home, right? That kind of change. I mean, in one day, every company in the world's cultures changed. Now, did they change it on their websites and on their t-shirts and their coffee mugs? No, but it shows you how ridiculous those, those aspirational cultures are. They're actually not being lived by. I mean, there's a guy from MIT named Don Sol who studies this. And he actually goes out to the Fortune 500 and surveys all the employees. And it turns out that no company in the Fortune 500 has employees that believe their company values that are on the website 
actually exists in reality. <laughs> Not one of, there's no correlation at all, right? Um, and then wow. I think there was like 80% of the, the values at the Fortune 500. And you're looking at every different industry, right? 80% of the values of culture are all the same. Agile, diverse, the diverse thinking, you know, diversity, um, you know, customer focus, like basically everybody's, you know, re recycling the same terms, okay? A tool like ours gets rid of the whole like conceptual blah, 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 and lets you measure it like a metric. And you can take snapshots in time. I have a snapshot of my company culture when I launched the company two years in, four years in, and today. And we can see how that culture has evolved, just like you can see how, you know, a shrinkage or, you know, lost goods in a store evolves every quarter, every month. Like every KPI, every metric that you watch over charts over time, you should see that with your company culture. And also, you know, through company phases, right? When you are 10,000 employees, your culture should be very different than what it is today. Yeah. I, I love watching you talk about this because you get so geeked when you're, when you're talking about <laughs> yeah. this. Like this is, you know, when, when a founder of a company is, is so into what he's talking about, um, it's, it's awesome to me. Like you, you love what you're doing. I, I don't believe that you go to work every day, do you? Like you, you no, this, this is just what you live. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm really big into meditation and it's ironic. I actually got this idea while meditating seven years ago. It like nice. just came to me in a, in a very like prophetic type of way. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. So you were just yeah, in the middle of a meditation and it just, it just came down and like everything from like the, the company name to the, the, the tagline to how we would get our first clients, how to build out the product. Like it was, and like, you know, it was coming from my head. So I, you know, it was my meditation, but it was a vision of things that I have never thought about before. I've had, you know, different experiences that would lead those kinds of ideas coming, but to put it all together in a software platform, doing it the way we do it, it was, it, you know, when they, people say like little miracles occur and everyone finds their passion and like, it's like, you, you know that you're meant to do something. I mean, on so many levels, that is true with me and this company. And as hard as it has been, I don't want to say it's been a cakewalk, you know, sure. you know six, seven years, you know, self-funded the whole thing myself and my roommate from college, um, you know, many millions of dollars in of my own money. So I, you know, still drive the same cars I have in 25 years. I still wear the same clothes for the last 10. I mean, I, I kind of, every dollar I've made for the last 30 years, I've put into this company, um, which is stressful, right? With a wife and two kids who are like, why don't you go yeah, back absolutely. and make a lot of money doing headhunting? Um, and then even COVID hitting, we lost revenue for six months of the year. So we, were, we almost went out of business, right? And I'm thinking, what was I doing? This was a crazy idea. Why would you ever listen to some idea in a meditation, you moron? <laughs> <laughs> but now the story's reversed. I was like, what a great idea. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, meditation. Um, so we're, we're doing great now. And, you know, we've won, you know, top 100 HR tech influencer, top startup in Miami, top HR analytics company. We're, we're partnering with the, the fourth biggest software company in the world. They're actually going to integrate everything we do across 60 million users in their current install base. So, you know, we, we probably will become the largest personality test in the world by end of next year. Dude, that's amazing. That's awesome. Good for you. Uh, you've also been selected to serve on the 2021 HR.com Future of Recruitment Technology Advisory Board. Um, let's see, here's another one. Uh, selected by another HR industry peer review group as top HR software of 2021. Uh, I mean, you're growing for sure. So yeah, I could see it. I could see it's, it. It's it's happening. It's happening. Um, so yeah, and and you know, we 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 even kind of Take, we've taken this idea of culture and taken away from being just about the executives down to like every employee and how they can live their highest vibration and be the best person they can be. So this concept, the, 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 the double bottom line, as they say, the do good impact for employees and people, just humans is we're democratizing self-awareness to all people. Because as you and I know, most of these personality tests are very expensive and are only given to VPs and above. It's not fair. Those are the people who don't need it. They actually already are self-aware and that's why they're executives. The people who need it are the other 90%. And so we've priced it at zero. We actually don't charge for the assessment so that it can be given to all employees and it can be given to 
every applicant to a job. That way, nobody's going to hold back on giving it out. And that way, we're giving this gift of self-awareness to the world. And my dream one day is that every resume in the planet, which is 7 billion resumes, there's no document on the planet that has more than 2 billion copies. And that's basically driver license. The resume is the most prolific document on the planet. And it looks the same everywhere, just like a cup or a glass does, because it is that essential to life, right? LinkedIn has put it on a right. digital format, but that's only 30% predictive of success. What you've done, who you are is 70% predictive. And who you are is self-awareness and an EQ, what we've taken to the next level of self-awareness, EQ is how you interact with others, not just so you can connect, collaborate, and communicate, but that you can understand them before you do those three things, which leads to resonance, a higher vibrational resonance between every two employees, between every team member, between all like vibrating molecules at an organization called human beings. That's way cool. That's awesome. Oh, that's it's a, it's been a wild ride for you, hasn't it? That's that's amazing. Yeah. Yes, you don't see the scars, but they're there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of want to get back into into the organization itself, and when you when you get on with a new company, say like Coca Cola, we we talked about them a little bit in this. When you come on with them. Do you ask them, like, what what do you think your culture is? And yes. then have the people take the test and then show them what their culture the, actually is? Yes. So we have a, a comparison tool that shows what companies think their culture is. And it's about five minutes to go in, on our 28 things on our, you know, there's like eight behaviors, 12 motivations and, and eight work styles every culture that any company could ever have would fit within that, right? We can, I think the total combinations are like 8,897 cultures, right? Whereas the Fortune 50 have basically seven. <laughs> we have 8,000 permeations of what culture could be. So every company goes in and does that and then they compare it. Um, and so um, uh, an example would be, let me, I'll share a screen and just show you how that works. So if you go here, let me just go down here. So you could go in, you know, at a, at a, at a team level. Oops. Okay, here we go. So you create what you think you are here. And this is basically what we thought we were what we wanted. So it's what you think you are, or what you want. I mean, it's a target culture, okay. right? It's what you think you are, sure. or what you, right. And then it'll show a, a, a comparison of that, of your current culture after the people, all these people take it, right. It'll show you what the target is, where you currently are. And then the gap 18%, you're only, we're only 18% of where we have to go. This is a, this is a demo data from three years sure. ago. So this is a, literally how we changed our culture to be balanced. We were way, if, as you can see, we, we were we were way over here changed, but we need to be more deliberate because you, you make a mistake with big companies and lots of clients. It costs a lot more than when you're a startup, you don't have any, right? Um, yeah. um, uh, we were uh, extremely free form, right? Uh, very creative, but no, we need to be much more cautious and think about things and look for repeatable processes. So this is the tool that we use to move our culture um, away from things like we had all, look, all these people, we have all these people who are knowledge-based, like we love thinking conceptually. We were all innovators about the future. It is impossible to scale a company with only knowledge, but you need practical people. So we started to hire here and we started to get these people to think this way. Um, so, you know, so we hire different people like these and we kind of train these people. Um, we didn't want such people to be so freedom oriented, right? It's like herding cats, me trying to, you know, the, once the company got to 20, 30 people, like, I didn't want everybody following their own sense of direction. <laughs> we need a little more order. Like we, you know, we need a little bit more loyalty to the company than everybody being like the head honcho decision maker. Um, we need right. to start making money, right? So you, you use this to see where the gaps are in your culture. And so that's been really, really helpful. And that's what our clients do. They want to say, look, we have a culture we've defined. We've told everybody this is what we are. We want to see and measure and the KPIs and metrics against that. And that's exactly what we do. And within one week, a company can see if there's a gap 
or if it's aligned or, and, and if it is a gap, it's not bad. They now have a tool that they can get to sure. where they want to be. So one of the things that you, you told me you wanted to talk about was how are companies going to look at culture in the future of work and to support team collaboration. So let's, let's talk about that because I, I think that that is going to change tremendously and it has already um, changed tremendously from the start of COVID. Um, it, that's been a huge change in the last 18 months. And, and I do think that it's going to keep continuing to change. How do you see that changing going forward? Yeah, so I, I think there's, you know, whether you work at the office or work from home, you know, that doesn't change the culture of how the company gets stuff done. But, but it is a change in, you know, how, how we work, right? How every company works, right? Um, you know, whether, you, whether we were using a desktop computer or a laptop for work, it doesn't change the culture. Now you're doing remote meetings instead of in the office. It doesn't change the culture. What it does change is the type of people who are going to succeed in that environment, right? And so what, what you saw, we had a call center company that had all these people at, at you know, thousands of call center agents. They used to be in an office. So five years ago, they moved to have people work from home. And what was fascinating was, and this is before COVID, most of the high performers in the office environment went home and became poor performers. And most of the poor performers in the office environment, when they got home, they became good performers. And nobody expected that, right? People thought people mm -hmm. didn't perform in the office. Oh, God, they're going to go even worse at home. No, they, they didn't like the whole, you know, with the call center, like you're so managed, like, like micromanaged. They actually did better when they were freed up to be at home and they were more motivated. And then the ones who did well in the office who liked the micromanagement, who needed that, well, they didn't have that at home and they got distracted. And so what we found and, and with our clients and with all the research shows is, the types of people will do well at home naturally um, working from home is different than the ones who like being in an office, right? If you're really belonging and of service, you want to be in an office with other people. You're now home alone. If let's say you don't even have family members, you're single and you're kind of stuck in 18 months and not belonging or serving other people, you're going to be frustrated. Now, it doesn't mean that those people can't adapt and learn how to enjoy it right? Like your opening statement about you didn't, it was uncomfortable. You didn't like what you were doing. Now you've adapted and it's not that way anymore. Everybody went through that when they moved to working remote. Okay. Some people loved it off the bat, obviously, but many people, it took a while. And now people, this is the new norm. I mean, I don't think people talk about it as like, you know, when we go back to work, I mean, it's kind of like, this is, I'm working hybrid. I might go in the office a couple of days, but I'll work from home. So I think that flexibility has just made every American, at least our clients, most of them are here, um, more entrepreneurial. Like the culture of entrepreneurism and the culture of getting stuff done and being more agile and being a problem solver, I think has kind of been lit under everybody because that's how we're all going to have to be now. Um, it, you know, it's, you, you have to figure out how to set up a copy machine at home by yourself. You have to figure out you know, if you don't have a fax machine, where to go to get make one, do one, right? It's all these little things everyone to succeed is, is getting tested um, for better or for worse. And companies are going to, you know, lose if they force people back to work because, you know, 80% of employees don't want to go back five days a week. You cannot yeah. take away the taste of the apple. If someone was commuting five days a week, an hour and a half each way, that's three hours a day times five days. That is 15 hours of a week that this person has just experienced more per week. <laughs> They're seeing the mm -hmm. sun at five now, instead of driving home and getting home in the dark, they're out doing exercise. They're with their kids. They're enjoying their children when they interrupt, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think people could ever dream, imagine now not experiencing those, those heartfelt experiences. So the future of work is a more heartfelt experience that's more agile. And the companies that adapt to, to offer that to their employees are going to succeed. And the companies that get stuck in their own way and say, well, we have a 20-year lease and we need to bring people back to get the money value well they're going to lose those employees and they're going to they're going to fall apart yeah yeah i think you're right so it's it's crazy because you know like i i had i had this change like we talked about from chief of staff to the account executive but my my big change was i i was working in the oil field before covid you know, so I was out for 30 days at a time yeah. and then home for two weeks. And I mean, working, 
you know, I mean, lifting heavy pipe and dragging around and I mean, working, <laughs> working. So COVID came and I lost my job and I was out of work for, you know, 15 months. Oh, wow. And then, and then I got this job. So I'd never had a tech job before. And, uh, Jim came along and he offered me this job. And I'm like, well, what do we have to lose? You know? So now being in this job, I've had, I don't know, five or six different positions now. I mean, going from that to a startup, you, you know what a startup's like, like nobody wears the same hat until everything kind of <laughs> evens <laughs> out. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I, there's times where I, I truly miss being out there and just working my butt off. Right. I mean, the, the lifting heavy stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm a big guy and I'm built to carry heavy crap. Right. Yeah. No. And, and I miss you, that. I yeah, miss that. It's... But I mean, I don't miss being gone 30 days at a time. I, I don't miss, I love being home. I love getting up and giving my kids a hug off to school and then being done and being able to pick them up from school and being home. I left for five days to go to Washington state to my best friend's son's wedding. And, uh, two days in my kids were calling me and they're like, dad, when are you coming home? Like they, I used to be gone for 30 days. What you're and talking like, about actually, yeah, whatever, by the way, this is a major shift that I don't think people in this country in the world realize Remember the whole like road warriors, the, the consultants who would fly and like be gone five days a week and only be home on weekends. One of the great things that COVID has done for this country is we're the third hardest working country in the world in terms of hours per week, which is not a good thing you want to put it like be gold medal, right. like, right? Family suffered for the last 80 years since the beginning of the industrial revolution, right? Or hundred, mm -hmm. whatever that 120 years, right? Since the turn of the century, 1900. The future of work, Family has a resurgence. Probably divorce goes down. Kids are happier. Mental illness goes down. So I know COVID's terrible. There are people who are dying and, and you know, right. you know better their souls and, and, and I feel for their families. But when we get through this and once the vaccines are kind of all out there, right, more people will die from the flu than from COVID starting next year, actually. Um, it's almost tied this year. Um, so what's going to stay, though, is family first, not company. This country got it wrong for the last 120 years where company was first and family was second. And I think the future of work is where family first, then it's me and my own career second, and then it's company third. And it's going to turn that whole pyramid upside down where we're not all just kind of like slaves to the man, to the company. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's a huge change, um, an inflection point that, that's going to that's be great for, for humanity uh, over the next decade or so. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So you measure your culture every couple of years. Yep. Is that about how often you tell your clients to measure theirs or is it different for, for every, everybody you work with? It's different for everyone we work with and within a company for every team, right? If there's a team of five people at Coca-Cola um, and they hire three new people one quarter, their three people's personality and way they work changes the dynamic. Three out of eight is a big change, right? 30% of the employees now are new. So they should definitely redo the team look visualization um, once those three people join, let's say they fire two people again, replace them. So I think as long as there's like turnover and change, you know, they should be measuring it. I think the overall institution should look at it every year, just like a metric. Um, you know, we recommend all employees at our clients to take it every year. It doesn't cost any extra money. Again, we're not trying to make money on every assessment that gets taken. <laughs> like that's the mm -hmm. old model. And those are personality tests that they're not offering much value after taking the test. So that's the only way they make money. We're offering value in the insights at the corporate company level, divisional level for hiring. We offer so many insights. We charge for those insights. We give the actual assessment and, and, and uh, self-awareness for free. So we tell companies, every employee should take it once a year and just see. Um, and so some years there won't be much of a movement. Some years it might be a big movement, right? If you know, I worked at a company called Siebel Systems, I was employee 120. One year later, we had 12,000 employees. We hired 1,000 people a month for 12 months, Tom Siebel. 
Um, it was a CRM software company. The founder, he was actually the founder of CRM. Um, the culture of that company was changing every three months. I mean, when you, I mean, there's no company that's ever grown that fast, but it was that kind of change. Now, other companies, you know, we work with Honda. They have 0% turnover. It's Union, Honda North America. It's Union. Mm -hmm. It's a Japanese company where they hire people for life, right? And so they take it every year, but we literally see no change. I mean, their culture has really stayed the same um, through the time. Now, <laughs> what, what would they use our tool for then? They use it for leadership and for collaboration and understanding each other. Um, there's a really cool tool that we call EQ Everywhere. Um, we've integrated for communication, especially for remote. Now that you don't see people, right? You want to be able to understand who they are if you haven't met them. And so we have this tool here where if you, but we, we have a tool where literally a little button comes up here called human intelligence so that when you click on a new email, you can actually click on the person's name. Right. It's not going to work because they, they're working on it, but you click on their name and it'll, it'll pull up their personality and how to communicate, how to influence them. When you go to a meeting, oh, nice. When you, when you go to a meeting, let's say there was a meeting of 10 people, you click on that same button that's up here and it'll tell you the culture of the meeting. Now I'm, they're working on it where there was a bug. So I heard that on sure. Monday on our team call. But it's a really cool tool because now you're taking what psychometrics used to be like a workshop model with a consultant. You have to do it as an offsite. Now all these cool little tips are being fed to you in an email if you want them or even in a meeting if you're a leader. Hey, Hey, leader, um, bud, you're having a meeting with 10 people. Mary and Steve are really shy and reflective. They're not going to answer the question first. You might want to hold space for them and be more inclusive because they're never going to get their voice heard if you don't. Um, if you're going to give an action item for tomorrow morning, urgently give it to, to Javier. Don't give it to Stephanie. Stephanie's really deliberate and doesn't like that kind of stress. Javier loves changing direction quickly, right? Um, so imagine every meeting and every collaboration point better because of these insights. We call it EQ everywhere, right? We're giving emotional intelligence to everyone in an organization at any point in their process and workflows, um, whether it be Gmail, Outlook, um, you know, Slack, any communication tools. Right. And I, I could see this helping so much with the pre-hire process mm -hmm. and getting so many different people in that you would never look at before. Correct. Because usually you have the final five people come, they interview, and you go with the one everybody likes the most. So more of the same. What about realizing that maybe you want to hire someone who's different from the rest of the team? Those interviews mm -hmm. aren't going to be smooth. They would never get hired unless the goal is we want culture ad. We want to have more diverse thinking. So it's okay that, that we like Mary more than John, but we're still going to hire John. On paper, all of them can do the job. Because, you know, the final four candidates, they can all do the job it's more who you end up liking and that's just is fraught with bias and people hiring themselves sure and and there's a huge mckinsey study that comes out every year on diversity equity and inclusion and what they just found in this last one for 2021 is that 70 percent of, of employees and executive teams feel like diversity is being attacked like uh, um being addressed you know people are getting hired with the different skin colors and races and religion i mean we have affirmative action this government this country really does a good job it can do better, but it, it, there is the focus on diversity where there's no focus is on inclusion. So if you have, let's say, you know, five old white guys in a, in a team or in a company or in a management team, you bring in a black person or Hispanic or, or a, a Asian, et cetera, or LGBTQ, et cetera. Well, it's not just good enough to hire them. They have to be understood. They have to be included. That's the problem because it's not just filling in the job, it's making them more in inclusive. And so our tool also focuses on inclusion where you, where you would actually put, pick up how these people think and work differently, right? How do Hispanics think and work differently than whites? How, how do whites think differently than blacks and vice versa? And, and a woman versus a man, if you wanna bring in women. And so it's okay, let's rejoice in our, in our differences but it's an understanding those differences that leads to more inclusion. That's the pain today at companies, less so the percent, like how many minorities do we have, how many women, um, and people get so stuck on those, those race right. type diversity, they're missing the bigger picture. Like you don't want to put a black person in or a, a Hispanic person in and have them fail. 
Like that doesn't help right. anything. Now he's like, well, no. see, it didn't work. <laughs> no, that's not the point. So. Yeah. And then you say, well, I tried, I tried to do my part and right. it just didn't work. Right. So then I, we oh, go we back. Hire that, that, yeah. that someone, they don't, they don't work here. Well, no, they're not being included. <laughs> right. No, It'd be the same if like, great tool, a, man. If, if there's like an all black company, let's say a hundred black employees and bring in a white person, and maybe there's different ways of communicating or different ways of working. Well, it's not, you'd have to be more inclusive for them to understand each other. So, you know, I think, right now there's a political war around making everything race related um it should be really positioned around diversity of thought uh, regardless of skin color and 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 a conversation around inclusion not differences um and constant pointing out of differences is you know uh, right. unless it's done in a way well, that's yeah, i mean you take that back to to how we started this conversation off right like you have somebody you have a, a company up in Boston, say, right? And they want to hire somebody down from the bayou. Right. right? I mean, <laughs> somebody who's very smart, but I mean they're they're gonna be thinking different, no matter what yes. their skin color is. Exactly. Right? You could have a bunch of white people from Boston hire a white person. White from people the bayou, from Bayou, and they're gonna it's the same problem. Right. I mean, it's just gonna be just gonna be different. Yeah. So um yeah you're right like i i wish and maybe we'll get over it maybe we won't but i, right. I wish the race thing could go away and and we could we could just start figuring out the the diversity of thought um because i i think that's a huge i think that's a i think that's a huge problem yeah yeah and and i think this tool would goes a long way um that little tool that you have you know, when you put their names in and Hey, you have this meeting and here's your, here's your meeting statistics that not only does it tell you, Hey, you have these people and this is, this is how they react, but how much stress does that take off of the person doing the meeting? Right? Like they don't have, they don't have the expectations of, you know, th their expectations go out the window. Now they know, Right. These person, these people are going to be interactive. These people are not going to be interactive. Now I know how to bring these people in. That stress is gone. Yep. Great tool, man. Great tool. Thank you. Love it. No, thank you. Like, this is awesome. And uh, it is absolutely free, by the way, because I'll, I'll tell you, I did this, the one that he shared um, when I was getting ready for this, I pulled it up and it's like free assessment. So I did it just so I could have it ready. And it was hundred percent free. It's awesome. And I am going to have my two CEOs do it so they can, they can get a taste of it. So it's awesome. Um, you have been more than generous, more than kind, uh, with your time and, and your conversation. Uh, so I will go ahead and land this plane here. Um, Two last questions that I ask everybody that's on this show. Number one, uh, what advice would you give to founders or soon to be founders that are going to be watching this program? It's going to be a lot harder and take a lot longer than you could ever plan. So if you think it's a three year project to launch the company and get to 1 million or to exit or to sell, whatever the goal you have, multiply it by two and think that it's going to be twice as hard before you start doing it. Nice. And, and just stick with it because. Yeah. And if you yeah. do do it, stick with it because as, as hard as it gets, you know, it you'll, whether it ends up exiting for the money you thought it could make or not, or for the products you thought you could bring the market or not, it's going to be a rewarding experience when you look back and there is no failure in a startup experience. Like there's no failure in life. It's just an experience um, where you learn from. So uh, there's a lot of learning in, in startups, whether they, whether they succeed or fail. Nice. And then what is the best way for viewers to get in touch with you if they so choose? Yeah. So they should go to um, if they want to write me directly. Uh, my email is Juan. J-U-A-N at human intelligence. We've combined 
uh, the word human intelligence to just uh, one word, humanintelligence.com. Nice. Well, Juan, this has been awesome. Uh, very good. Very good conversation. I have very much enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, we had we had a hiccup to get started, uh, but we we overcame that, and and uh, I very much appreciate you. So you have a very good rest of your day, and uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's all I have to say. You have right, anything well, thanks, else? But I'm 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 humbled and honored that you had me on the show. Great, great uh, uh, podcast. Great questions. Way to pull out. Uh, insights that uh, it was very free flowing. So I really appreciate you and, and what you do. Uh, and, and God bless you.